you know, I attend a lot of SEO conferences and mm. people are building blogs, building websites, attracting a lot of traffic to that site, making a ton of affiliate commission and income from the blog and then selling it. And they earn six, seven figures from doing that. So it's an actual uh, income, it's an actual career for a lot of people. So blogging is definitely not dead. If this can work, then affiliate links, okay, come, come, <laughs> come my way. So, do you know how I how I heard about you? No, I don't think so. <laughs> so, I don't want to sound creepy, right? Like, I DM you on Instagram. Yeah, you did. <laughs> I did, I did. Okay, I did. But not creepy. I actually met Fan Liang uh, in Georgia. Oh. So, I was in Tbilisi. I was in Georgia at first, right? And then um, another friend texted me to say, Hey, uh, I have a friend that is coming in. He's also an investor. You should meet him for... Dinner. Yeah. So that's when I met Fun. Oh. And then and then we're talking, you know, try to understand like, w- why is he here in Tbilisi yeah. and all that? And then of course, the main reason is because Tbilisi is like a one-year visa-free kind of situation for Singaporeans and Malaysians, right? So so he went there and mm. I was there and then we were chatting. I tell him my experience. Then he mm. told me about you. How did yeah, he the was like he was like, I was inspired by this person. <gasps> wow. Yeah. And then I was like... <laughs> Who is this person? He was uh, so excited. It's like, you know, right? You know this person? I was really? like, no, I don't know this person. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. And then and then he just showed me your Instagram. So did he follow my handle because of me? Or did he have a you know his his handle? Yes. <laughs> yes. That is Fan Liang, you come out and clarify. Yes. He copied you he around the world. He refused to tell me. No, no. no so yes, yes, yes. It yes. was quite funny. Okay, this is just a random bit. Like, so I met him in person in Ben's school last year, last summer, and then I introduced him to one of my mentees of my SEO course. Mm. And all of us had an ending around the world. So it's fun around the world. And then his name is Dan Brown the world. And then there's me, Mm. Bell around the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He definitely copied you. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, shout out to you, Fun, right? Uh, I have Bell in the house, right? In the studio with me. So yeah, finally. The truth is... Finally. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Finally, truth is us. Finally, you're here too. Yeah, it's been one year in the making. Yeah, yeah. I remember I did a pre-call with you in Peru. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, and then for some reason, it didn't Didn't work work out, out, you know? And... For another big reason, you are back in Singapore. That's why we are in the studio. What happened? Come share, share uh, with us. What well, can bring Belle back to Singapore? <laughs> I know, right? It takes like a mountain yeah. to move me back to Singapore. <laughs> or an injury in uh, my case. Uh, so uh. I was actually based in Bali for a few months. And then just one day, I was walking home from uh, after dinner, like walking back to my co-working space at 10 in the night. Bali roads are terrible. The lights are also bad. And you always have to like, you know, tiptoe at the side with the traffic. It was dark, couldn't see. And uh, I just fell into a hole as I was walking. And then there was metal rungs that poked out of it. So the knee piercing through my skin. I had to do five stitches on the spot. I thought it was just a superficial thing. Like, you know... Uh, recover and move. life goes on but then I realised I couldn't even bend my knee as time went on so I thought okay one month in I don't think I can take it anymore it's time to go back to Singapore to seek professional healthcare so I did an MRI realised that I tore my patella tendon which is what connects the knee to the tibia so the doctor put me on a brace so I couldn't walk I mean I couldn't bend my knee for three weeks and then after that I had to do physio and all that rehab to recover regain the strength of my mm. upper leg hence why I'm still here <laughs> yeah it's been it's been crazy that's why I saw Belle in Singapore I was like girl is in Singapore mm. right it's a very opportunistic yeah. huh? but yeah. How, how has your Good healing timing. been? Uh, it's been going well, I guess. I mean, I like to look at things from, you know, the best, uh, like the, the most <laughs> you try, like, you try. positive <laughs> side of things. So, well, at least I can walk. I'm slowly resuming all my sports activities, mm. but mm. it will still take some time. Mm. But then you're uh, traveling tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> time of recording. Uh, then she tell me, hey, tomorrow i packing, i I leaving. I was like, huh? Yeah, it's quite on a whim. I decided, bought the ticket like last week. I was supposed to fly on Saturday, but then my friend was like, oh, why don't you come join me on this lake because it's on the way. Mm. So I said, okay, fine. Thursday, I'll, I'll go. Yeah. So where are you going next? So tomorrow, I am flying to Bangkok for two days and then I'll go to Phuket to work with a few hotels. And then I will fly to Europe because I'm speaking at Bensco Nomad Fest about content marketing at the end of June. So it's quite a fun <laughs> event. I went there last summer, met a bunch of digital nomads. It was the first time I actually put myself out there because usually I'll just work remotely on my own. So putting myself out there with 
the rest of like-minded people really gave me like a newfound sense of family, sense of belonging. Really? Yeah, and that's why I decided to go back this time and, and be a speaker and mm. connect back with people. So there are always a lot of returning attendees. So it's nice to reconnect back with friends. And mm. there are friends that I made there last year that we are still super close, even though we are scattered in this different parts of the world. Wow. So what got you into this way of life? Well, for starters, I never really enjoyed office life in Singapore, although I thought that that was the way to go after you graduate from school. How long were you in it? One year. <laughs> hey, but, but, That's but, a very quick decision. But, yeah. No, no, no. I did yes. like a whole six months long internship at an agency, in a oh. PR agency, and I really loathed it. Mm. And that was when I swore I wouldn't go back to office life again. But I mean, reality is reality. So I still had to find a job after graduation. But after that one year, I just decided that... Like, I've always wanted to try working overseas, but it seemed like there are two choices, right? Either you work up the corporate ladder or you find a job that allows you to travel. So when I saw this opportunity for me to do a working holiday in New Zealand, on top of being invited by Tourism New Zealand because I was back then working up to be a freelance writer and also as a travel blogger. So I had this invitation by Tourism New Zealand and I thought it was a, an opportunity that I couldn't say no to. Mm. So everything aligned, I decided to quit my job and go to New Zealand and uh, spend six months doing a working holiday. So that's like work and travel. So I found a job at a glacier company that brings tourists up to the glacier to like explore Experience the caves, the explore the glacier. So that was really fun. Wow. Yeah. And that's all part of the working holiday. Wait, how many years yeah. ago was this? I did that in 2018. Okay, okay. So it's quite a few years. Okay, yeah. for our audience, I think you can still meet the bar for a working holiday. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah the you last be... leg already, 30 and yeah, below, right? Be yeah, 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 last leg. Uh, some of you <laughs> cannot, right? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, how, how was it for you? Like the working holiday? It was holiday? quite life-changing because... Like if I were to just compare the interviewers, the New Zealanders, they would ask you, hey, so how has your trip been in New Zealand? Uh, what have you experienced? How are you? You know, that's the first questions that they ask. Uh, whereas in Singapore, you know, they go straight to the point. They're like, oh, why do you want this job? Why are you qualified? So it's a bit more personal over there. They care more about their like well-being and life. Mm. Uh, whereas in Singapore, it's really all about chasing the KPIs. Yeah, but, but you realize when you're there, you're working for a glacier hiking company. <laughs> when you're here, you work for a PR agency. Yeah. It's a different ball game, right? Yeah, it's, that too. If you are in Wellington, right? Or in the heart mm. of New Zealand, mm. like in the city and you're working for a PR company, I, I presume it's similar in Maybe. the intensity. Maybe, but I feel yeah. like they have more heart. Like, mm. they're a bit more personal. It's not all mm. about work. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Okay. And and that cemented your decision to live a non-Singaporean life. No, that and also like just realizing that the different environments can affect you differently as well. You know, like you're, if, if you're in a city, you, it can be quite stressful and fast-paced. Whereas like over there, it's a lot of nature, a lot of very slow living. You don't need to be doing things all the time. It's okay to just have can, nothing Can you describe on. a little bit more for wow. our audience that maybe, you know, have lived in the city yeah. <laughs> forever? Because mm. I kind of know what you're saying, but mm. I want to hear your, your view. Okay, so mm. you wake up to, you know, maybe the cows mooing or chickens clucking. <laughs> That's the one thing. That's the first thing. And when it's your off day, you get to do nothing or you get to kind of just run along the plains of New Zealand with the sheep beside you. When you go to sleep, it's complete darkness. You can see the stars at night. You don't have to go to a secluded corner to find stars. For leisure, we would like go hiking or, you know, look for swimming holes to swim at if it's summer. Not Just very, mall. yeah, very <laughs> carefree, very mm. like relaxed. Yeah, yeah. And, and, th and I think that kind of opens up the whole how Singaporean look at a way of life mm. and like there's all these other way of life you know to to go about doing it lah, right so and for you you take pride in that you know exploring different type of mm. uh, way of life and, and all that jazz right and yeah. so with that as the backdrop you know mm. and I know in your articles and the thing you write is uh, seven consistent income mm. blah 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 I was like wow well, I gotta ask her mm. man like, like how are you keeping up with this way of life from a financial standpoint Okay, so it's always about your input outweighing your output, right? Let's say you want to work remotely. You want to make sure that you have a skill that can allow you to work remotely. And then from there, working your way 
in terms of output, choosing a destination, for example, the cost of living is about a bit more affordable and then really balancing it out accordingly. Okay, so we, we take it step by step, right? Yeah, so yeah, we yeah. talk about cost of living, right? Uh-huh. So you've tried so many places. Mm. If someone is a newbie, you know, mm. starting in Singapore and they want to go out there, where would you recommend them to start? I would say Bali is a good place to start because it's already an established digital nomad destination. Mm. The one thing I wouldn't say is very conducive for a first timer is the cost like just because all of these experts are coming in that's why the cost is it's been crazy right is it very vivid like the experience out of all the digital nomad destinations i've been i think it's one of the costlier ones i've been to really but compared to singapore standards it would still be cheaper Mm. give give us some numbers yeah in terms of so i have this blog post that talks about my cost of living in Bali, but in terms of accommodation, you can find anywhere from maybe seven fifty a month upwards for a room, your own private bathroom. That's actually like quite expensive, eh? For a digital nomad uh, situation. Yeah, I mean yeah. it's relative. I was spending time before the Russian Ukraine war. I was spending somewhere like a three four hundred sing for a. One bedroom type of studio situation with kitchen with toilet everything mm. in Tbilisi. Yeah. Okay, like you gotta fly all the way there, right? It's a yeah, that's the other thing. Yeah, it's a very different Whereas way of life. Singapore, Bali is maybe like one hundred dollars per flight. And then I think food wise, it's about the same or slightly cheaper than Singapore. A lot more healthier options though. And transport is really cheap. Obviously, it's like $1 to take a Gojek scooter right anywhere. If you want to take the Gojek scooter, if you rent your own scooters, it's even cheaper. Every time you refill your petrol, it's also about a few bucks each time. Mm. So that goes a long way. I would say in terms of hobbies and activities, I find that Bali is so much cheaper. You can do yoga or go to the gym for much less than in Singapore. If you want to go surfing, that kind of thing also. There's more activities as well compared to Singapore. So that's why I enjoy that place. Okay, okay, fair. So another <laughs> vote for Bali with them. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's a reason why everybody's converging, right? But there's of course the other side where more and more people converge mm. and the cost kind of moves up. Mm. And, and all that right so so that's a, that's a different discussion today I want to focus on the inputs right yeah. the, the income how are you going to make money you yeah. know to, to keep this thing so for me my travel blog has always been my main source of income that's been very crucial in that I don't just focus on social media because there is this one time sometime last year I suddenly got a message from Facebook Meta that said that my account got disabled got suspended for no good reason um, and that went on to like radio silence from them for a couple of months, no matter how much I tried to reach out to them through their help channels whatsoever. Not very helpful one. Yeah. yeah it's very no, annoying. It's like, yeah, si- like, radio silence. No help yeah. at all. Zen desk back end, everything. Man. <laughs> Push yeah. you down the path. Yeah. So yeah. imagine if I only relied on Instagram for my income, then that's basically from all to nothing. So I realized that, yeah, you need to own your own platform. And so for me as a content creator, it was having the website as my main platform that mm. helped me to generate income with which comes from, so there's ads, like when you scroll through my articles, you'll see ads, unless you have ad blocker on, (laughs) or that's passive income. And then there is also affiliate commissions that come from, let's say I introduce certain hotels for you to stay Mm. and I have an affiliate partnership with them. So either hotels or tours or brands, if they have an affiliate program and I promote those brands with a link so if you go ahead and buy then i earn a small commission Mm. so that's kind of a passive income and then there is active incomes like advertising for example i have this post on the best clubs in amsterdam and then there is this brand that sells nightlife tickets in amsterdam if i'm not wrong that reached out to me saying that hey i want to place a brand mention on your post because it's doing very well it's ranking number one on google and so then we negotiate Mm. yeah so how much would that kind of look like um so i charge in usd that would look around 250 us per year okay and mention is just like one paragraph with a thing like that yeah okay okay interesting interesting and for all of you that didn't know affiliate links is very common uh, in the in the digital marketing space right essentially i hate affiliate links i'm uh, just saying right <laughs> 
I hate affiliate. All you sponsors don't talk to me about affiliate. Uh. You send me affiliate, I will block you. Uh. <laughs> so, but anyway, anyway, uh, the different creators choose a different way to monetize and all that, right? So, mm. and affiliate links is something you will see, you know, like those kind of like six things to do in where, where, where. And then one of the things, there'll be some sort of a link, it goes in, you know, that's the crudest. Lah, right? mm. But there are many other ways to go about. But yeah. anytime you go through, you know, Bell's website or any other website and you click in, you go into somewhere else that they ask you to buy something or book something, then that is in some way an affiliate link already, right? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. And sometimes, I mean, like if you're a good content marketer, sometimes don't even notice that it is an affiliate link because it's placed so naturally. Like mm. if I have actually experienced this SIM card or if I've actually used this international SIM card, when people are asking me, oh, so how do you get data when you're traveling to London? Then I just tell them, oh, this is the SIM card that I use. This is the link that I use to purchase it. So sometimes it's very natural because people are actually looking for answers mm. to these products. Mm-hmm. Okay, and, yeah. and that's the part of a good marketer, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Must make it feel like it's, it's not obvious, Nash. right? Yeah. So, okay, okay. Very cool, very cool. Mm. So, um, for clarification, do you already have the blog before you went down this rabbit hole of digital nomading? Or? It was never uh, planned. Uh, mm-hmm. I first started it because I went on my student exchange, right? Like with all universities. I went for a semester abroad to France. Then I thought, okay, this is going to be my last break. Last ever. break ever yeah. before I start my corporate life and, and become, become a corporate slave for the Set rest life. of my life. So okay. I was like, okay, I need to document this. Mm-hmm. I need to travel as much as I can. So that's how I started the blog because I wanted to document it and I wanted to share my knowledge with other students who will eventually go through the same footsteps as I did. Sounds like a very sad footstep. Uh, well, it's your last bit of freedom, <laughs> yeah. so you have to play I know, I know. as much many as people you can. Do that. Right? Yes, yeah. yes, many people do that. Okay. Yeah. So as I went on, I realized that, oh, there are so many travel bloggers that can actually travel full-time. How do I do that? Mm. But back then, one, I was from Singapore, whereas those other bloggers were a bit more established. They have big US or UK audiences. Whereas I am, you know, Singapore has a limited demographic. So I was still kind of tiptoeing should I just leave it as a hobby blog or should I pursue it full-time so I was just learning everything along the way while working in a full-time job but the more I went on the more convinced like I could tell from myself like from my own behavior I was putting a lot of time and effort into the blog when my boss wasn't looking or like when I didn't have much work to do I, I would just pour my time and effort into growing the blog so that's where I knew that okay this is where maybe my passion lie or where I really wanted to put in more time and effort into and so yeah I spent that time and I really put in the investment to nurture this hobby blog mm. back then at what point how much page visits are you getting you yeah. know like all that so I worked backwards right in order for me to do it full time I need to Proof to my parents, proof to myself that I could earn at least the same amount as I did in my full-time job in Singapore. Mm-hmm. So when I worked backwards and I figured out how much money I need to earn, and this is how much traffic I need to get in order to earn this amount, my target back then was, I think, around 25,000 page views per month. Okay, okay. Yeah. Hey, welcome to the Financial Coconut Podcast Network. I'm your host, Reggie, aka Your Chief Financial Coconut. And if you are loving what we are creating here, like, share, subscribe, share with your loved ones, comment in the comment section below. And yeah, we'll see you for great content on Chill Swift TFC. If someone wants to start a blog today yeah. right and like it, it sounds crazy right? mm. anybody wants to start a blog today you know but yeah if someone wants to start a blog today you know how do they go about growing to this size i don't think it's that hard because i feel like there is a proven way these days mm. to do it you don't have to try an error like i did back then which took me three years to do full time it's a lot of strategic research and looking at the demand of keywords whether people are searching for this particular topic or whether this particular topic is already so saturated, like how to lose weight fast. You are never ever rank for that. So don't even bother to try. Yeah, and just working backwards from there. If you think about it from the many ways that you recommend or you, or you tell people that you can make money in all mm. these different ways, building a blog is still something that you think people should do. You know, I attend a lot of SEO conferences and mm. people are building blogs, building websites, attracting a lot of traffic to that site, making a ton of affiliate commission and income from the blog and then selling it. So it's like buying a website, flipping the website and they earn six, seven figures from doing that. So it's an actual... Uh. 
oh. income. It's an actual career for a lot of people. So blogging is definitely not dead. Okay, okay. So I must I must take my words. Right? If, <laughs> if this can work, then affiliate links, yeah. okay, come, come. <laughs> come my way, right? Then, then we, we can strategize, right? Off, yeah. off, off the record. Mm. Oh my God, that's wild. Okay, so so if someone wants to start today, you, you still say, let's, let's do a blog. A lot mm. of people are still starting a lot of new websites today. Okay. You just have to find a profitable niche, mm, something mm. that's not a, already overly saturated mm, and mm. then think about like the business strategy side of things. Okay, so what is the business strategy side of things? You know, with search intent, there is always informational searches and transactional searches. Like if you're looking for the best vacuum cleaner, you already have the intent to buy a vacuum cleaner that suits your purposes. So that's a very broad term, but that, that's a way to start. Like thinking along those lines and then doing deeper research to see what else that other people are searching for that the internet hasn't covered and then starting a website that covers all of that topics. Okay, okay, fair. But but the internet cover a lot of things already. I know, no, but is there's it? always gaps, you know. <laughs> Okay, so what is one place that because you are too busy to to do oh. it, you know? That, then I'm giving away then, my trade secrets. Right? That's why I'm no, asking, but, what, right, right? No, but if you want to work together, we can work together to build a site. <laughs> there is one site that I have absolutely no time to deal with, but I know it's very profitable, like gifts, for example. Gifts. Yeah. So if like you, well, I'm already revealing it, but mm. there are a lot of very specific keywords revolving around gifts that you can talk about, like for example. Gifts for horse lovers, gifts for eight-year-old boys, gifts for guitar players, that sort of thing uh, that you can, you know, go deeper into and like create articles and, and then start ranking it on Google and then earning affiliate commission. Because these, again, these are transactional keywords where people are actually searching because they need to buy gifts for horse lovers. Okay, okay. When we talk about the, the topic of gifts, right? Okay, though we don't let everything out, lah, huh? But mm. but if I think about gifts for a guitar lover, how should I think about this thing? Like writing an article around it and then like building it towards like a one stop shop of like all you need to know about gifting. Well, as part of SEO, as part of search engine optimization, it is about being a an authority in the topic that you're writing about. So that's one of the ways to rank on Google. And that's what a lot of people are doing, like being hyper-focused, being hyper-niche, and then writing like a bunch of articles about it. Say like coffee, you can go into all these different coffee origins, become an authority in coffee, and then you need to sell your coffee machine. or And then you start recommending the best coffee machines. It's very easy for you to rank at the top because... Google sees you as an authority. So whatever you recommend, it's trustworthy and it's credible. And so it's easy for you to rank at the top. And then once people are clicking in, it's very easy to convert because they are looking for best coffee machines to buy. Mm, the intent is very yeah. high, right? That's what we call the buyer intent, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Fair, fair, fair. And, and in one of your posts, right, you talk a little bit about like the 10 things about digital nomading, you know, mm -hmm. and then inside, you, inside, I think you talk a little bit about how there's a higher income potential you know, and, and I was like, really? Mm. Right, better than working a corporate job here? Mm. You know, can, can you kind of expound that for us a little? Yeah, for me, I think the argument is quite clear. Like when you work in a corporate job, you're working fixed hours. So essentially, you're still trading time for money. Whereas when you are your own boss or you're self-employed, you are basically the sky is your limit. You want to work as hard as you can. You want to work as little as you can. As long as you know how to strategize, you can make the money work for you. Mm, mm. For example, like the passive income streams that you get involved in, you mm. don't have to. Versus if you were to work for someone on an hourly basis, say like tutoring, you are being paid for a fixed amount per hour. Mm. But that is a, there's a survivor bias here, right? In a sense that you made it, it works, and then you'll be like, yeah, it can work, but is it really for everyone? To be fair, nothing is for everybody. Yeah. Okay, that, that's clear. But I just want to get a bit more color on like yeah, when yeah. you say that right it's mm. like oh okay 10 things blah 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 and then like you can make potentially make more money right like give us a bit more mm. anchor on like what is the possible success rate you know what are we looking yeah. at you know amongst the 10 people that you've met the newbies digital nomad that tried yeah. based on your personal experience there is a lot of different types of digital nomad work mm. I mean the most common one I would say are freelancers right where you're really working for a client and providing a service I think that's where most people would start out if they want to do remote work. And then there are the kinds of people that just do purely investing. So really, it's 
not even working. It's more like using that time to do research and then investing. Shout out to Fun. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, you are. Where well, are you now? Yes. I've seen him working, but I've yeah. seen him playing a lot also. Yeah, so yeah, I don't yeah. know how I much he works. I see him playing all the time. So I was like, oh my goodness, but yes, please. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, those are the investors. And then there are those that are, you know, doing their startups, um, running their own business. So that can, again, range from being bloggers to like being a coach, for example. So then it really depends. I would say this from experience. The good thing about being self-employed from being your own boss is that no one's there to boss your time. No one's there to dictate when you have to work or give you deadlines, which is pros and cons. But there is this like flexibility and freedom that like the, just this stress that's lifted up from not having to have the bosses nagging at the back of your mind the whole time. How are you then making use of this freedom? Because at least from, from me, right, I feel like there's a gap here for me because when I was doing the whole digital nomad thing, right, I still went into a very repetitive cycle. You know, I was still doing the same thing, you know, checking emails, doing recording mm. and, you know, going to the gym, you know, doing the weekend walks. I was like, why do I want to walk on the weekend? But I still do it, right? Mm. You know, it's like, it's the same shenanigan and I try trying to hang on to a structure that has been inbuilt into the system, but then trying to embrace that freedom. How, how have you kind of done that? Wow. You know what I'm saying? It's a bit I, meta. I, huh? I, I, think, <laughs> I think so, but it's always been the opposite for me. So mm. for me, I feel like I live by the whole carpe diem <laughs> way of life, which uh -huh. is like, you know, you're only visiting this place probably once in your life. So you have to make full use of the time that you have in this one place. So I would work in my free time. But then again, because I've already established my business, right? But for me, it's like this work-life balance that you have to balance out eventually. For me, it is, you know, putting some hours of work, but then also leaving time to experience things for the first time or experience things that are unique to that place. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't difficult for me also because I enjoy experiencing new things. Mm -hmm. So for me to say no to fun activities, it's like FOMO. Mm -mm -mm -mm. yeah so well the good thing about my work is that it's not tied to time so if i don't work it doesn't mean that i'm not earning money and mm. that's why i'm a bit more lax and also because i put in the hard work in the beginning so i feel like i don't have to be guilty whenever i want to go out and play okay okay so the website is your base ground mm. for you to live such a life so what you're saying is the website has been built to a certain level that it's just kind of like making its money on its own mm -hmm. you're not actively doing a lot of things things mm -hmm. there you know mm -hmm. and with that built then it's like how you build a portfolio or how you build anything you've built something the system allows you to continue to do that then you just can do all the other shenanigans yes basically. you know ba basically I have the luxury to experiment different mm. activities different hobbies so that's good but again it's a how much you want to push yourself. I mean, I definitely have goals this year that I want to surpass the previous years. So I'm definitely also trying to move around less often and trying to put in more focus, more time on the business to grow it. Mm, what is your What is your goal for, for this year? Oh, I definitely want to hit six figures in, in USD and uh, focus more, like have more of my income come from the passive part than the active part. Yeah, so that, I mean, it again helps me to further that goal of not having to tie down time time for money mm, so mm. that I have the ability to pursue more of my hobbies and interests. Yeah, I, I, I kind of know what you're saying, but don't you think that that on some level is still pursuing the same goals that many Singaporeans are doing? You know, like it's still like money accumulating so that you are empowered to do other things, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's like, is this whole shenanigan like you cannot run out of it? Like what you're anchored on is still, is still very Singaporean or is it just like across the board, everyone thinks like that? For me, the money that I earn allows me to free up time to pursue things that I've always wanted to do that are outside but, but of the But don't box. you already have enough to pursue what you want to do and then you can do anything? Objective, no? Uh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> so what are you going to do more with that income that you're not going to do now because of lack of that? Well, I think it's more to... Okay, so if let's say I had my passive income streams set up more, then I would be able to work less, right? Yeah. So what are you, what are you able to do with that in mind when you achieve that that you cannot do right now because I think for a lot of people when they tune in and when they look at your blog you know they, they hear all these things so it's like actually Belle can do a lot of things really well. <laughs> yeah I guess it's the next stage of life which is you know being able to live more in comfort Mm. So for me, I was never too fussed up about living in a shabby condition or living in a luxurious penthouse. But it's always nice to be able to kind of just spend without guilt or be able to travel to more places without having the cost of living there in mind. Mm. So again, it's about like wanting to experience more things okay. that 
initially money constrains you, but now with more income, then it doesn't constrain you as much. Okay, okay, fair, fair. I, I, I get it. Good clarification. Okay, okay. Approve, <laughs> approve. <laughs> but yeah. so then, what is what is one thing that you feel like a lot of Singaporeans are pursuing, but you have vividly just like you know, I'm done. This is not my thing at all. How do you how do you go about with that? I would say the one thing that stands out is career progression or like climbing the corporate ladder that is something I've thrown out of the window since my first year at the <laughs> corporate job in 2017 uh, uh, uh. after I graduated what about BTO HDB all this kind of thing do you, do you still care okay so after traveling for five years full time now I definitely feel like I'm at a stage where I want to have my own base I want to have my own place I want to feel like a sense of belonging where I can be unapologetically myself mm. and I don't really find that in Singapore because when you're back home you're kind of living with your parents Mm. and buying a place here is quite uninspiring as compared to you know other places (laughs) in the world I love how she said it it's not very expensive it's uninspiring it's It's just like that it's a box right and 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 you're built right next to thousands of people living in the same box (laughs) if you're living if you've been to Bali and you've lived in the villas there you Uh, know uh, what uh, I mean uh, mm, mm, mm. so in other words like BTO is is not your thing you're not going to give a like damn about it when I don't even have someone to BTO yeah 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 yeah. okay so so that's the thing like I mean even if I'm at the age where I can get my own property I still uninspiring yeah 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 it's the lifestyle here that is different from the lifestyle that I aspire to lead mm. so even if I got a place here I don't see myself living here full time mm. so I mean the ultimate goal is to have different bases where I would be able to travel like you know stay a few months at each place and then start traveling for a bit around. and then yeah but yeah that that's the goal like of being able to have my own base uh, eventually, maybe a couple of years down the road or soon, sooner. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. how much do you want to accumulate to to be able to do that? Because once you buy a house, you're, you're committing to quite a big thing, right? Like, uh-huh. like it's going to be on your balance sheet. Every month you look at that thing, yeah. you're going to pay the mortgage. Unless you're going to full cash and, mm-hmm. and, and buy it. Like what is Bell's goal? financially in that sense Mm. how much money do I need to accumulate to create this network of different bases yeah well I haven't (sighs) thought that far but Mm. the closest thing I've come to I mean when I was traveling quite a bit in during the pandemic one thing that I started doing was also pet sitting and being able to stay in someone else's home where they had like the full stereo system they have bicycles they have board games they have pets because I was there to pet sit right really made me feel homesick for a place like that so I started kind of like looking for places and seeing what kind of environments I want to be in but the closest thing I've gotten to actually like figuring out that a place is feasible for me to get was I would say Bali because the property market there is very hot there are a lot of foreigners that are getting buying properties there and the startup cost isn't that high for like a decent villa how much would it cost I would say around 200,000 but this is not freehold this is probably like a 24 year lease which Mm. is extendable so I mean when you do the math it's probably about the same price as Singapore but (laughs) because the tourism there is so lucrative whenever you're not staying there you can always rent it out nightly and Airbnb prices are very lucrative in that sense you can easily recoup the cost of buying it in a couple of years Mm -hmm. okay fair I I, I know what you're saying Mm. very very shrewd actually Mm. yeah it's it's not just a blog you know (laughs) just not just traveling around doing programs and there's very good thoughts around there then you were talking about traveling fatigue right you know, yes. on, on some level and, and I felt that right like mm. but I think you 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 went on much longer <laughs> mm. you know before you you feel that because at some point of my digital nomad thing I felt like there's only so much of life that I can live out of a backpack mm. right I are you at a zone because it sounds like you you are yeah okay so for example last year 2022 i traveled to 20 countries in one year which was absolutely insane very tiring for sure it also depends on different circumstances so during the pandemic i was traveling with someone and it was nice and inspiring again back to my i think my original mission which is to inspire and to empower people through travels so I was traveling with someone who had never gone out of his country before. And so being able to see him take the subway train for the first time was, you know, quite... Quite interesting, yeah? Yeah, it's like, it's like I'm desensitized to things like, wow, oh, going to Europe to travel or going to a new continent. But then being able to see travel for the first time through somebody else's eyes, it's quite empowering for me. It's quite interesting. So... Yeah. 
that was one of the reasons that really pushed me to travel. And also, it's so much easier to plan the logistics with someone else than, than on your own. So Two people can share Airbnb, <laughs> them yeah. sure. So these days, it's a, quite a bit of a hassle for me to go to places. And so that was one of the reasons why I'm like, okay, I want to slow down. Uh, so yes, definitely travel fatigue. I, I talk about also like travel burnout. So for me these days, it's more I travel because there is a purpose there like for example i'm going to bulgaria to speak at the conference or i go to different places to attend conferences to learn or maybe even to connect with like-minded people where there is like more collaborative spirits like i would to in bali so you don't think your life is on some level limited by the backpack okay so what, what happened was at some point when i base somewhere then i will buy things <laughs> that you know like i need right and then once I start packing up from that place and go to the next place, right? I will have all these things that I will go to the mm-hmm. the main co-working space or like the main hostels or like the people that are staying around say, hey, you want not? You want not? You want this? You want this? Because I just cannot bring them around, uh-huh. right? And, and <laughs> the cycle repeats mm-hmm. once I go to the next place. And eventually at some point, I feel like my life is being limited by that backpack. There are some things in your life that are just important that you cannot carry on a backpack yeah that's true Mm. to some degree it is quite limiting like this one thing that i really really crave is having an office set up because i work from anywhere exactly (laughs) like i don't have a desktop i don't have a mouse i don't have a keyboard (laughs) exactly yeah i guess it's the one thing that i feel like i truly truly am lacking when i'm traveling But Mm. other than that, it's taught me to live minimally, which is really questioning whether you need this mark Mm. when Mm. you travel. And most of the time, a lot of things you don't really need. And also the less you have, the happier you can become because you don't have to stress so much. Uh, Also from personal experience, I learned this. One of the reasons why I don't carry, you know, expensive equipment, like, you know, having a smartwatch, it's one thing I have to worry about when I leave it on the counter. Yeah, so um, that's like one thing that I can stress less when I am traveling minimally. Mm. And as far as being limited by your backpack, there's a lot of things that you can still do if the destination allows you. I, okay, maybe this is not as easy as it sounds, but maybe there are... There bands. are. I went straight to the shops. Like I searched, yeah. where's a Chinese instrument shop? I went there. You can uh, rent nah, and play? I played it and the or person you... was like, I've not seen someone at mm. that skill in a long time. I like, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, yeah, yeah. so yeah, you will figure, you will figure, yeah, you know, and you but at some point in time, I still feel like I need a base that I can have like all these things around that, yeah. that I actually want, not rubbish that people tell me I need to buy, mm. you know, but a certain level of comfort yeah, for sure. that needs to be established only when you settle down, mm. right? And that's a very interesting discussion that we can have another time. Okay. Yeah. Closing, our uh, last question. Okay. Mm. Since, since you're here, right? I think a lot of people want to hear your trade secrets, lah, right? Of course, they can learn your course Mm-mm. and everything, right? All that shenanigans. But can you teach us a few tricks on how to get a post to rank very up there? Ooh, okay. I mm. would say it first has to do with research. You can't just write anything that you want. Mm. You have to see if there's a demand. So what tools do you use to know whether there's a demand? You can always use Google search. Like, let's say you input two words and then before you hit enter there's usually a drop down and then you can see what are the long tail keywords that people are searching for okay so okay i'll give you an example how to lose weight is Mm. a super competitive term but then if you searched how to lose weight with intermittent fasting as a teenager that's a very specific term that probably most people would not have written about it whereas if you see that google search suggested it that means people are probably searching for it but that's a very vague result that you can see Mm. i use paid tools like key search like hrefs to look at the numbers uh, the search result the search demand so like how many a h r e f s okay yeah so that's a bit more advanced i would start with key search Mm. which is maybe like $16 a month. Key search is 99 US a month, a bit more advanced. So yeah, those keyword research tools give you the search demand and the difficulty level. So even if you are very new to it, you can look at difficulty level to determine if a particular search term is worth writing about. But then again, you can't just write one post and expect it to rank. Uh, back to what I was saying about being a topical authority in whatever you want, like in that broad topic you want to write in clusters so then just writing tons of content about it to show google that you are an expert in that topic 
Mm-hmm. So the whole thing about like backlinks and all that, are those important? Yes, it is also important. So that is another metric that Google uses to determine if you are an authority. If you get linked by like, you know, big sites, CNBC, CNN, Huffington Post, Forbes, if you get them to link to you or if you get a mention by them, it goes to show Google that all oh, these big guys are vouching for you because they are putting your name on their article. Mm. So that instantly boosts your authority. So that's Mm. all part of growing your authority in your website space. Mm, Nice. So what I'm hearing is still that the big guys have a lot of authority even in the digital media space. They definitely have authority. So how a website is measured, it's called domain authority or domain rating. And each website has a number associated to it based on their authority in the website space. So Wikipedia, for example, is probably 99 out of 100, the most authoritative source. And all the new sites would be pretty high as well. So the aim is to get a high domain rating as high as possible so that it is easier for you to rank for whatever topic you're talking about. Wow. So what is your rating? Ugh, I can't remember often. Like maybe 42. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Fair, fair. Yeah. So, <laughs> Out of 100. Yeah. So we will um, continue our discussion about gifts, you know, after yes, this. we can do that. <laughs> but yeah, thank you. Thank you for spending time with yeah. us. All right, thanks for sharing. And please check out our website. Anything you want to plug? Anything you want to let our audience know? Well, if you're interested to hear more about my stories, digital nomad tips, or even interested in learning about SEO, I have everything on my blog, bellaroundtheworld.com. I'm also present on Instagram and YouTube. So I'm always happy to answer any questions if you want to reach out and DM me. Nice. Yeah, yeah. That's why I did. La. That's why she came on the show. So yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you. you for your time. Lovely. Thank you for having me. So first question is, what has been your best and worst investment you've ever made? I think best investment would be getting that domain name and deciding to get serious with the website. So instead of bellaroundtheworld.wordpress.com or .blogspot.com, I decided to really legitimize it, bellaroundtheworld.com. And even my email, it has a, it's not at gmail.com, right? It's at like whatever name at bellaroundtheworld.com. And then that's when sponsors, brands, everybody who, you know, looks at your website, which becomes a portfolio, they know that you're taking it seriously and are more willing to work with you, are more willing to pay you. Um, as for worst investments, I would say cheap hires. So I'm at a point where, you know, like I I need a team to help me to further my business and scale up. And I mean, the easiest, most obvious way is to kind of hire the cheapest and most experienced person. But you realize that sometimes they have poor work ethics or they're not truthful and things like that. So all the time and effort spent into grooming them turns out to be back to ground zero. Mm. So it's really learning how to hire better. Mm. Fair, fair. Yeah. It's a complex discussion, <laughs> right? Next question. What is one thing under $100 that has been a game changer for you? Okay, this goes back to like my secondary school days. Oh my goodness. <laughs> but I think this changed game my changed life. long yeah. ago. I, I read this book called How to Win Friends and Influence People by mm. Dale Carnegie. I'm mm. sure all of you have seen or read it before. I probably read it when I was like secondary three, sec like three mm. or sec like four. Mm. Because, you know, back then I was very self-conscious. I was always worried about what people would judge me, what people would think of me. Mm. And then reading that, I realized, I don't know, I started giving... Zero, zero Fs about, about, yeah, what, about people what people think. think about me and just deciding to become a better version of myself. So since mm. then, like most of my books that I read, and I don't read a lot, but most of the books that I read would be self-development books because mm. I learn a lot through that. And so I'm sure you met the subtle art of blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I read okay, that too. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So and that's why she go modeling. She just don't <laughs> care about what you think. It's just about me. Yeah, yeah. Right, it's uh, yeah. about building self-confidence because eventually it's... <laughs> like it's a great asset to have mm. like people are willing to work with you you connect better with other people mm, as well. mm. yeah yeah and, and when I saw you went to she was like wow very cool very cool <laughs> yes yeah. breaking breaking it right going further yes. uh, last question is what is one place you learn that you think is underrated it can be a book a particular website a YouTube channel a podcast anything uh, I feel like it's a uh, Facebook groups which Facebook group it really depends on what you are interested in learning. So mm. there are forums. It doesn't have to be Facebook also. For me, it was Facebook groups, like surrounding myself with like-minded people, with travel bloggers. People are asking questions. People are giving advice. And that was where I learned the most. 
So maybe you want to be a digital nomad. Um, you can go to digital nomad groups and there are always questions that people are asking that you probably have that same question as well. And then you can be inspired and you can learn a lot from all these people who have been there and done that and become empowered to mm. embark on that lifestyle yourself. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just go to the hustle networks. Everyone is there. You'll get to know everybody. So yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Lovely. Sweet. 